California and Los Angeles you know, declared that all schools, no matter what, will be closed for the entire fall. And um, Harvard announced that fall and spring teachings and other universities too will be completely online. So um, we don't really know um, what will happen here. The numbers are going up in 38 states. New York is doing very well. We had one day even without a corona death. So it is quite, um, quite a complicated time for everybody in theater, of course, still uh, there's no end of that uh, closing inside for sure till the end of the year, nothing um, will, will happen. And uh, theater artists, um, of course, are in the center of uh, what it means to be necessary or not necessary, essential or not essential. And, uh, mm -hmm. and now they are forced to stay at home and think things through and uh, wonder what their contribution is to society, to the arts. Um, I always do think that great theater, great performances, and also sports is a reward of a functioning society, a great society, and the better it is, more better theaters you will see. So at the moment, we don't see it, and especially here, we know it's not working, and it's been a disastrous leadership. Today, we have with us a very significant artist, a, a young director from Europe, a young female director, Susanne Kennedy, who is based in Berlin. She um, studied uh, in Amsterdam, and she has uh, done extraordinary uh, work uh, for the theater. And uh, we are really, really uh, thrilled to have you uh, with us, Susanne. Thank you for, for joining us. Thank you for having me. Yeah, and uh, I'm just gonna read a few lines of, uh, from her bio. She, uh, um, in her work, which I saw the opening of Ultra World in, in January, I was lucky uh, to be that she responds to the balance of power between bodies, technical objects, and machines with aesthetics that is beyond the human or the human body, distorted by masks, playback, dialogue, doppelgangers, and multimedia, the actor confronts the audience with a post-humanistic subjectivity. In that uh, ultra world, she investigated consciousness as a virtual construction, like our thinking, our consciousness, to understand that what we do is a virtual construction, how we understand the world. And she simulates the transformation of the human uh, with, uh, within it. And uh, so, uh, um, Susanna, um, first of all, before we come to your work, where are you at the moment and uh, what time is it? It's uh, six o'clock in the evening and I am in south of Germany at, um, this is actually my boyfriend's old room. I mean, because we're at his parents' home and this is the room he used to be in. And um, we, and my parents, they're like, I don't know, a few kilometers from here. They're not so far away. We used to go to the, uh, nearly the same schools. So it was schools next to each other. And I fancied him when I was 15 and he was 18. I always saw him on the bus. And then we didn't see each other for 20 years. And now we're together for six years and working together. So uh, all the, my past work I've done with him, he's a visual artist. So every time we come here to south of Germany, we can visit both, both our parents, which is quite funny. So, yes. That's quite, uh, quite, uh, quite lucky, quite beautiful. So is it Bavaria or southern Germany? It's Baden-Württemberg. Baden-Württemberg. So it's near the Black Forest, actually. There's a lot of forest oh. here. Uh -huh. So that's, um, that's, that's quite amazing. So um, what is going on? Are Berlin artists uh, leaving Berlin? Um, I don't know if they are leaving Berlin. It's sometimes good to leave Berlin, but I think it's a good city to come back to always. I feel very at home in Berlin. And um, I have to say, Berlin has been quite generous to its artists. Um, I don't know if you heard about it, but it's it, during this um, time, difficult time where people couldn't work and had no income, that the city gave artists and you could just apply for it. And the next day you had, you got uh, uh, money on your account, like 5,000 euros. And um, I was lucky I didn't have to do it because I still got 
paid at that time, but a lot of my friends got the money and it really helped them. And that was just such a great gesture. I thought it was amazing that this suddenly can happen and you could just apply for it and get it and you don't have to pay back and you don't have to account for it. It's, yeah, sometimes these things are possible. So yeah, this was a moment where I thought, yes, it's, it's, it's beautiful to live in a city that's able to do that now. Yeah. It's uh, just, just stunning, especially compared to, to the situation in New York, where I think even artists from the Metropolitan Opera haven't been paid since March and uh, nothing has been given. There are absolutely no jobs, um, whether they're musicians, technicians, uh, actors, directors. Um, everything is closed and so much is based anyway, as you know, on nonprofit, on donations. And uh, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a most, most difficult time. So that sounds really like an earthly a paradise, but it also does show that this city is uh, is a city of the arts, and um, and I think I'm sure no one will will forget uh, what did it. Even Great Britain, I think, just donated or gave two billion dollars towards the arts institutions and uh, to the arts. But here, of course, it's a, it's a complicated, complex uh, um, situation. So, um, where were you when it all happened? What were you doing? And uh, when the news came that things shut down. Uh, we were rehearsing in Munich. Our uh, last uh, work was Oracle. So we were into the rehearsals, I think, about two weeks. And in the beginning, everybody was, uh, yeah, this will pass, this will blow over really quickly. And then suddenly they said no shows anymore. And then it was, okay, you have to leave and go back as soon as possible. And then yeah, we had to leave. Everybody, everybody had to leave, and there was a. We had a big crew of people, also from Brazil, because we had a lot of technical stuff we were working on. So everybody had to go back, and we went back to Berlin and stayed there for the next two months, not knowing if we would be able to uh, continue the work or not. And I, in between, I completely abandoned it because I thought it's not going to be possible to to finish it. But amazingly enough, at the end of May suddenly in Bavaria, they said, okay, it's, it's possible to rehearse again with certain measures. And we were able to come back and complete the work and show it to audience. So um, that has actually been possible in Munich. In Berlin, it's not possible yet. So for us, it was, um, we were so lucky. And uh, Oracle is an installation and it was, uh, we, we meant to do it for four people. At, in a, so you can pass through it as a, as a group. But now it was even possible because of the COVID situation to do it for one person, which is such a great luxury. So you can walk through the installation on your own and you go through different rooms and situations and you get to meet the Oracle, which is a robot. Um, and we could show it. I mean, it was amazing. So for me, this is a very strange time where some people are still in, in this situation of, of, of lockdown and, 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 and thinking how to deal with it. And we already had a premiere. We already had a, a show, possibility to show the work. Yeah, it's quite crazy, actually. How did it feel rehearsing? Did you, I guess, did you have all that mask or what were the restrictions and... Yes, we all had masks and keep uh, and and we were supposed to um, keep this dist distance. And someone, uh, virologist. How do you say that? Virologe. Um, virologist. Virologist exactly came, and um, we walked through the whole installation, and she told us what was possible and what not, and then we adapted things. And um, but it was very easy. Somehow, my uh, my work is very corona proof somehow because they're all keeping their distance anyway, and they're not talking. It's playback, which means. Um, you um, can even get closer than if you, because often in German theater, there's a lot of shouting and running and that's- uh, Loud enough. shouting, yes. Yes, uh, naked shouting, running, that's a cliche, but it's often true. <laughs> and so with me, it's very rigid and they don't talk themselves. So I also with Ultra World, which you saw, we could, um, we made it, uh, Corona proof, and we didn't have to change a lot. 
So they're wearing kind of shields, see-through shields, which I mm -hmm. like a lot because I think they're quite beautiful. So, and then I didn't, I could just, because we're going to show the work in Austria. So a lot is still happening in, in, in my case, which is not the case for other people. I know that. So it's, uh, I'm talking from a diff different position here. Yeah. And how did it feel for you as an artist to say, to work in? To, you mean? Well, yeah. To, was that, you adapted fast or did something happen that was even better or worse or well i think i'm always someone who adapts very fast i think when you work in theater you always because things never work out the way you intended them to work out always something happens and it doesn't it doesn't go like you planned it to go so i think as a director or an artist in the theater you have to have that mindset anyway so um i tried to especially with the with the shields we said okay let's use the shields but really make them into something beautiful we put little lights in into the shields so you they are like lit up faces in the dark and um i really i really thought okay how can i how can i use i had i had the feeling that also the audience that came was very open very vulnerable because of course it was just after lockdown and people were allowed to to go somewhere again and kind of meet meet actors it was so it was quite powerful so i always try to see what what can i use of this situation and um i I was working with Oracle. We, I was very interested in the idea of incubation. Um, so this ancient Greek practice where you would go to a sacred place and then um, go lie down in a dark place, sometimes for days and nights. And caves. Right. Caves, exactly. And you were um, either sick or crisis in crisis, or you had a, a question, and often there was also some kind of oracle. Um, and then in dreams, you would get answers or healing. So it was very much a healing, a place of healing. So, of course, coming out of this um, lockdown situation and all these questions that uh, that we asked ourselves during that time were very valid in the in in the oracle installation also people asked the oracle a lot of things concerning what's going to happen in the future what's my place in it what um what am i supposed to do how how can i deal with it and and that idea of incubation so not going out not engaging, not um, getting uh, everything from outside, but trying yeah, to conf con be confronted with yourself, which is very difficult. And we have not learned to do, and we run away from often. And to see if theater can be a place, a kind of sacred place in a way where we can go if that's possible, I mean, uh, we'll see how it will continue in the future. But still, this idea that it's a place where we can ask profound questions about ourselves and the world and the reality we live in. So coming out from that kind of incubation period and, and being able to, to practice it in a sense, because we do not have these ritual centers or rituals at all anymore. So I have the feeling maybe we need to, yeah, we need to try and, and, and build them again. And, and for me, theater has this power, is this place of being in the here and now with other, with other people. So that's something I'm trying to work on. Mm -hmm. how, how, how interesting how you connect uh... A most ancient uh, tradition. <clears throat> I know for some of the oracles, I mean, you had to go through um, uh, walkways cut into stones, you know, hundreds, I mean, they're very small. And uh, to get to, to these places where you then spend time alone, some say that even fumes would come out of the earth. But often there was a, a prophet, a seer, or an oracle, a woman, or it was a person. So you had a robot 
So t tell us about your idea of the post-human and uh, th that new technology, which you... Yeah, I think um, technology makes it possible for us to ask questions about who we are. So it's not so much that I'm so much into technology and I think the future uh, is gonna be so different and, and, and more exciting than it is now, but it is because we're so confronted with technology, I think it gives us the possibility to ask ourselves, but who are we? Who is this human being being thrown onto earth? What's my purpose here? So um, I think I use technology to, to look at the human being again and to ask what, what, what makes a human being a human being and also how is it that we put ourselves in a, in a kind of hierarchy and um, everything beneath us is that, and also of course, I mean, it, it's being talked about a lot this, uh, in the, this past time, maybe it's not a very good idea to do that. So I'm using technology as a metaphysical means, I would say. And also this idea about um, virtual reality, I'm not so much interested in, you know, gaming or, or, or wearing uh, these VR masks to go into different reality. I have the feeling what the reality we live in um, is a kind of virtual rea reality that we create with our own thinking in a sense. So I'm trying to go into that and to, to, um, to ask maybe different questions and because it's something that I have the feeling we do not go um, often in our own lives, not go far enough with these questions. So I'm trying to create a space where we can ask these questions. And of course, I don't want to ask them only intellectually or not at all intellectually maybe, but very much also with the body. And, and so then what does it mean to talk? What does it mean to... Um, to not have a face anymore, to um, who, who are you if you don't talk yourself or you wear a mask? So um, yes, that's, these, these are, these are, this is a kind of very personal research for me. Mm -hmm. This time of incubation, let's say that, and Corona, I guess one could, uh, include that for you also. What did, did something change for you? Did, did you get insights? Or how did you experience as a person? How did you experience this time? Uh, in the beginning, I was very excited because I thought something's happening in a big way. And I was, I was, I don't know, I was open for it, I guess. And then, of course, because you, then the everyday life inside <laughs> was um, going on and it became more and more uh, difficult. Also because, of course, we were with a little child and then I thought, and so it's really very much about family life and I didn't have much time to reflect on what I felt or what was going on. So there were there were quite um, there were periods where were that were difficult also because you don't know for how long this is going to take. I mean it could be this is the new reality and it is in a way. But then um, but then suddenly it was over. So lockdown was over and we could jump back into rehearsals and at the somehow I don't think I can already really talk about it. I have the feeling it's too early to um, make conclusions somehow because it has just happened and it's such a big thing. So I think it will take years and years to really process it and, and, and find answers and also to work with it. You know, as artists, you let things pass through you and then see what, where it takes you in the work. So it's far too early to, to be able to 
to also really find language for it, I guess. Hmm. You, you have a feeling it's over from that Germany went through it? Yeah, it's, I mean, in, in, everyone, of course, is talking about the second wave. And, and I, at some point, I stopped looking at the numbers, I have to say. So I also didn't didn't read the news anymore. So I, because I, I, I had the feeling for me, it didn't help me. So it was also in this idea of incubation. Okay, then I'm trying to go deeper somewhere else and not look outside so much. Um, and for me, it stayed abstract because I, I knew one person who had it, but very, very mild symptoms. And so I could not, in a sense, experience it myself. Um, I could experience the, me the measures that were, be were being taken, but the virus to me was, and still is, uh, abstract. And that's something really difficult because how do you deal with something that is, you're being told is there, but you don't, you have no experience with it, except the, what's the consequences of it in, in because trying to protect yourself from it. So that's something I'm still thinking about. What does that mean and how, how can you react uh, to it in a very personal way that you do not just listen what someone else tells you and then you, you do it, but that you find your own way in it. And that's something that's also maybe also too early because we can only listen to what other people tell us and the numbers and the situation. So I don't know, maybe it's different in, in the US and New York that you really see what it does, yeah. I guess. I, so yeah, it depends which, probably also which country you live in. Yeah, 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 no, here yeah, I think it's still, still in full uh, full range. New York is uh, better. Uh, there was one day without a, a dead corona desk but, uh, around the country and I think in 38 or 40 states it's going up in traumatic uh, numbers. I think um, Los Angeles, as I said, you know, just decided to clear, close all schools for the fall. So you had, you say we are looking for answers, we will talk into each other, but tell us about the idea of the robot oracle. How was it artificial intelligence project and what answers did the robot help to find people to get answers? What did it give? How did it work? What was the idea behind it? So the idea was that you would get prepared before you met the Oracle, because you can't just walk in and go straight to the Oracle and ask your questions. You really need to, in a sense, cleanse and think about the question you want to ask and get into a different state of mind. So first you met the kind of priests, actors that would talk to you. Then you had to lie on beds. We call them incubation beds. You had to go to incubation tank and then you, and you had to stay in a room and be silent with, with one actor. So it's also, it's a kind of going through different stages before you were able to meet the Oracle. And then you would go into a room and there was a robot arm and an eye and you would talk to it. And the, I, the thing with artificial intelligence is I was, before I started working with it, I, my expectations, what artificial intelligence is, were much higher than they are now, I have to say, because there's a lot of work behind the scene that you have to do. Um, um, so it's always, I mean, it's a lot of testing that you you have to see okay what do people ask and how can we answer can we answer that so it's a lot of human work actually so the idea of artificial intelligence and really i got a different picture of that so but what you can do is you can ask the robot three questions and it goes into a kind of database um, where it comes up with answers and of course I also prepared the database, but it's also random. It just picks um, answers um, from the internet. So it's a combination of that. And for the database, I was, um, I was accessing um, texts from different spiritual masters and, um, and trying to come up with answers that are so 
um, all encompassing, but so specific at the same time that you that you feel that you you're being meant, which was very interesting work because you have to think of of what kind of questions will people ask and how can you re respond to that even you, if you don't know how what they're going to ask. Mm -hmm. uh, so we build a kind of dialogue tree to do that and. Um, and people, it was amazing because people were so open and so they asked such existential questions in that room that I was not prepared for. So in a sense, is as if it's as if we built something and we we could hardly deal with it, what it became. It's this, it is as if people are much more open toward a, a robot than they would be in front of a different human being. And that is really something I'm still thinking about because I also want to continue the work and develop it further. What does it mean and what's my responsibility in it? How do I, how do I, um, because I, I had the feeling it's I'm no longer a, a theater director doesn't, you know, what do I do as a theater director with people being so vulnerable and open and trusting us or this situation? It, it has been a very, really amazing experience and it takes me somewhere else where it's, it's yeah, I, I, I feel I have to still I have to learn something about something that I don't know exactly what it is yet. Mm -hmm. No, I think it's a, it's a beautiful idea to go back to that. Perhaps what so many people say, theater started in a shamanistic tradition to put on the fur of the animal you were hunting and you set something, dance something and practice some form of magic and uh, a connection to a, a spiritual life. And uh, it also reminds of Joseph Weizenbaum's early uh, in experiments in the 70s when he had like pretended the computer would know and could answer you but he just had random uh, answers and John Cage uh, of course you know worked with chance and said that this like the beginning a significant uh, artistic um, um, uttering uh, of also what and Cunningham had the computer do his uh, choreography but uh, my question also is the post-human which you deal with and the world, the virtual world and meditation. Do you feel theater in a way has kind of lost its way from this origin, from that kind of past seeking, from, uh, from the idea of meditation? Are you, do you meditate? I, what is that a practice for you? Do you want to integrate that in your work? Uh, um, I'm not an experienced meditator, so I do it like I think a lot of people on and off. And when I don't feel so good, I think, okay, let, maybe I should start meditating again, but I've never really, really done it as a practice, but it's something I have a longing somehow. And um, it's, it's something that um, I feel in the theater um, that I also long for. So it's, it's, I'm trying to create something in the theater that I, I, I have a feeling would also help me um, get into a different space where I can um, uh, experience reality in a different way. So it's not a, so much about reflecting or researching, but really about experiencing. Um, I once had um, uh, um, a work that was called Women in Trouble, that was at the Volksbühne in Ber Berlin. And um, I was talking to, um, to someone who, um, after the performance, and he told me, and I, he, I, he didn't even like it that much. So it was not to his taste, I think. But he said, it, I felt so strange um, leaving the theater and going outside. It was as if reality itself was somehow suddenly very strange. and I. I walked to my car and suddenly the whole idea of a car was very strange and other people looked different and I got into a car and I drove to a red light and it, it all felt so weird and um, so and I thought I was so beautiful because so it didn't matter if he liked it or he didn't like it but it is, it is as if it was 
suddenly your own perception of reality changed and that the theater him spending two hours in the theater and then going outside again and being able to see it with different eyes even if it was just for I don't know five minutes or something like that um that that felt so strong to me that I thought this is this is for me what it's what it's about and then creating a, a kind of ritual um because it is it is this practice where the the actors take you somewhere, take you to to a kind of place where you can. Maybe you can go there by meditating. I I don't know because I'm not. Um, as I said, I'm not a, a regular meditator, so I've never been there with by myself. But I have the feeling in theater, if it's if if you use the right means and you believe in theater and it has that power that you that you can go there together as a group. Mm -hmm. That is a space for um, one experience, like looking at a painting. Bob Wilson always sometimes said, I think once famously, that all oh, this, I think lots of European theater is fascist, you know, because they tell you what to think, the playwright, the director, it's not open. I like to look at things and, uh, and experience a, a, um, a landscape or trees or the idea of animals and, uh, and, and, and things. People said in your work, it almost looks like a second life, you know, that kind of online experience, an early one that existed, or they are virtual reality sets. Your actors don't speak, most of it is recordings, right? If I also understand right. So tell us a bit about that idea, because it's such a unique and uh, uh, original and authentic uh, discovery you made. Yes, I think it comes from the uh, from the fact that I always went to the theater and I had the feeling it's not I cannot relate to it the way human beings are shown on stage. Um, I always I always had a longing to be much more drawn in by the actors than the actors showing me what they're feeling and what they're what they're uh, experiencing and, and, and shouting it or putting it out there. So I was very much thinking, how can I come, how can I make it more intimate, personal through the voice? And that's when I discovered that through uh, doing playback and we recorded the voices in the studio, where you can go very quiet and have a very different kind of tone, um, which is in a way kind of, um, very film-like, um, uh, um, and I, I like that a lot. And but, but it was also that I had the feeling, what um, what I was talking about earlier, um, this idea of how the human being is is represented on stage is through conventions that we have accepted as a kind of realism that we say yes yes this is how people are but if I look at people uh, on the street or just in a cafe uh, I find people um, if I would see two people talking to each other in front of a supermarket let's say and I would put them just exactly like they are and how they're talking and the kind of language they're using and put them like that on stage it would be a very absurd scene so I've always had the feeling that we do not have the right means to show what reality is really like on uh, uh, on stage and reality in 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 everyday life and reality can be you know everything I mean it can sometimes be very very strange and so I was searching for um, means to do that to convey this kind of feeling that I sometimes have when I'm just watching people on the street um, and find uh, an atmosphere on stage to be able to to, to convey this feeling but also how people um, how how the actors would move and and uh, or not move on stage. So because so the 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 conventional means of portraying people on stage did not um, um, yeah did not work for me. So I had to invent something else. 
and I did it step by step. So in the beginning, I was still working with actors who talked on stage and uh, used their own voices. And then it got more and more radical because I thought, okay, if I, if I, if I get away with this, then I'm going to go even further. Uh, and um, yes, it's also trying to push theater to, to its own boundaries, even thinking, are there boundaries? When does it stop being theater? But very much to go back to the root of theater somehow. So what you said about the shaman shamanistic practices is very important to me. Um, um, so I'm trying to um, go back to something that's very essential of theater because of course you have this moment uh, as an artist where I think why why bother why theater and that's when I thought no it has to be theater because it is there's such uh, immense uh, immense power in the the fact that we're together in this room we're quiet as an audience we um, we're in the dark often and we, we spend this time together to go somewhere. I think that's so strong and there's hardly, hardly any other places that do that. So in a, in a, in a sense, it is something sacred. Um, and the idea that the actors are like robots and are this idea of the post-human, it's, um, it's, it's, um, it's not so much, like I said before, that I, 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 I use technology to, to find out really uh, what's essential about human beings, I guess. So it's very much about the human being and not so much about robots, I guess. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just um, a stunning... Um... I, um, that on one hand you have this ancient, you know, tradition of a, of a spiritual path or of a meditating or finding answers for the essential questions of life. On the other hand, uh, your your stage and perhaps next to I think I remember sequences from Bob Wilson's Cologne Civil Wars where the astronauts were on the letters or maybe Richard Foreman work. I, I have never seen anything as in its plasticity. Um, something from the future of a, a modeled virtual world as in your world, as in your ultra world, I was something that, yeah, was a message from the future in a way. Um, and um, and um, that you uh, uh, think, you know, this is a way for us as audiences to experience um, this. And then if you have a plastic shield on as an actor or not, it doesn't really matter if you hear the voice or not, it doesn't matter. Like in film, it is, it is uh, of course, recorded anyway. So um, your research, and you did a Chekhov also, I think the Three Sisters. Yes. Which, you know, <clears throat> I don't know where it fit in in your career, which of course people say it's the one of the most realistic representation, even so if you look at it, it's so highly constructed. You know, it's so people, what people say and what they do, is the complete opposite. Um, a stranger comes into a familiar setting, everything changes, then he leaves, but it's still the same. Sisters sing at the end, outside in the garden, and you think that's ritual, that's a normal, but nobody really, really also does it. So wh what was what was your interest in a, then the post-human and the Chekhov? How do you get it together? Um, it was, in, in fact, it was a very simple um, thought about it that led me to do this this play which is the idea that the three sisters are caught in an eternal loop because we play them over and over again it's it's one of these classics that you can find in nearly every theater in in, in germany and all over the world that so they're being um, put on stage over and over again for decades and they never get to moscow so they're caught in this eternal loop and we as an audience are part of that because we go to the theater and we um, know we're going to watch them not getting to Moscow um, and um, it's something that fascinated me because I thought okay this is this idea of this loop 
um, is very much um, part of these classics. So we watch um, the three sisters not getting to Moscow. We watch Medea killing her children over and over again. We resurrect them, put them back on stage and, and, and watch them do it again, like strange puppets or avatars that we, you know, um, and, and, and we watch Hamlet saying to be or not to be over and over again. So what is this need to, to, to watch the same story over and over again of people not succeeding, dying um, and, not, and not getting anywhere. So the, the Three Sisters, um, for me, was uh, the idea that they're stuck in this room, in a sense, and never get to Moscow. And I, I, I combined it with, the, with um, Nietzsche, the, the idea of the eternal recurrence, uh, so that what do you do when a demon comes to you at night and asks you um, to live the life you're living now over and over again, or just even just once again, um, do you throw yourself on the floor with desperation and say, oh my God, this is hell? Or do you say, yes, I can do that? So this is very existential, crucial question. It, it's the, really the question of how do you live your life and is it, is, it, um, is it worth living this life again for you? Um, so that... And being posed that question already does something to you, of course, because you take a distance, you look at your life and you, um, you think about it. So for me, that was the idea of this eternal loop of the three sisters, then putting this question out and the idea how much of uh, co how much consciousness do they, these three women have about so it's, it's a, a meta question about this, them being stuck in this situation and being watched by us uh, over and over again. And is there a possibility of freeing them, which is not getting them to Moscow. But for me, it's the, in a, in a sense, what we all have to do, that we have to do it in the here and now, the situation we're in. So it's also a good image for the lockdown. I think you're yeah. in your in your uh, kitchen or wherever you are, and this is where you have to do it. And this is very difficult, and um, we have never learned it. That's also part of meditation, of course, sitting on that pillow and doing it here and now. And um, yes, so that's. A very personal question that I and I used Chekhov's Three Sisters for it, and um, I I could not get them there. I have to say, in the sense that I I I, I so that's something also in my work that I always watched um, characters on stage, the characters I created, not being able to reach this kind of consciousness. And I thought I have to, I have to make a work where this at least happens at some point, even if it's for a short moment. Because if I if I don't, then why would I think it's possible? So, but but it, I guess it's 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 connected to my own path in a sense. It's not it's not something that's. Um, you know, that I, I have experienced it and now I'm going to show it on stage. No, it's something that I'm also s struggling with and searching for. So I, with Ultra World, it was something that I thought, okay, let's have the main character um, have a journey, a kind of hero's journey, where there might be the possibility of understanding Understanding something or experience something at the end where he can break through the idea, this illusion that he has created about, um, about his own reality and, and be able to access something else. What that something else is, I don't know, but I wanted it to, to try it on stage and see if it, if it was possible. Mm -hmm. 
So in a way, still a Joseph Campbell hero story, but in an adapted 21st century uh, um, lab experiment uh, for, for, for theater. So how did you visualize? I, I think there were aliens involved, but just for our listeners and me, it would be interesting for the three sisters. How did you show these a loop? How did you approach that visually and dramatically in the dramaturgy? Um, so it was also because we work a lot with, so the idea of the virtual reality, we always think because the work is of course very important that I work with a team of uh, artists together that um, video sound installation, it's very important. So we created a set where uh, there was a little white cube uh, as uh, high up and um, around it was a um, projection, but a projection of a different room. So it was a room within a room, it was 3D within 2D. And that created a ve already a very strange effect as if, as if the three sisters were in some kind of strange space shuttle or something like that. And then um, I had actually the whole play consisted practically I think one scene out of Chekhov but variations of it um, so there was always a little variation of the scene but in between there were blackouts um, with really loud noise and then the light went back on again and the scene was a bit ch changed so sometimes they wore masks sometimes suddenly there were older women on stage sometimes you could see them act the actors in their private clothing so it was uh, the same scene, but as if it was in parallel worlds um, or in different time frames, uh, some more in kind of Chekhov's, Chekhov's time, maybe, but not. I mean, we didn't use costumes like that, but it could have been. And then suddenly very modern and then suddenly going back again. And then suddenly they looked like aliens. And then suddenly, so it was very much switching, bam, 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 from one... Um, reality to the next and as if it's different three sisters in, in parallel realities. And we really try to use the um, mach theater machines to be able to do that. We wanted to create some kind of magic, I think, because I had this idea, how can we switch from one scene to the next, but not like in theater, but as if it were film in a sense. And so we really worked, worked uh, on that, and uh, I think I think it, it it's I, it had that effect eventually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, from what I could see and read about, it, it's it's stunning because it's easy to have ideas and what you all talked about, but to find something on stage that works and you did uh, this is it, it's astonishing and uh, stunning and uh, and also makes us you know, look with big eyes with wonder again on, on something that we think we knew and we all have seen so many and of the, of the three sisters. How do you match then images, let's say in the ultra world with the, with the words perhaps, because that's the only thing that I was thinking about, the visual was so strong, these worlds where um, um, uh, the projections you use, the clarity of it, the uh, crispness, um, and then the, the writing, how do, how do you approach it? Can that really match? Or how do, you, how do you select the words, for example, the language you also put as a layer on the movements and these incredible costumes and uh, the lighting, but also the projection. How do, you, how do you choose it and what's the reason? Um, with Ultra World, I was of course different than Three Sisters because I kind of composed it myself. And I use um, text very much in the sense like text passes through us every day. So what we read on the internet, what we uh, talk to, say to each other in conversations, a lot of snippets I use um, from, 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 video games i so i sometimes watch youtube videos of interviews between i don't know actors famous actors and an interview i write that down and then i use the comments that are written underneath so it's really this is um i create text from 
from the masses of text that uh, we encounter every day and usually texts that we wouldn't use in a poetic um, in a poetic way so um, if someone says me a, uh, 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 sends me a whatsapp mas- message it could end up in a play because I so it's it's in a sense what I think it's called a bit this idea of um, uncreative re- writing Mm-hmm. Kenneth Goldsmith, I think his name is. Kenneth Goldsmith, yeah, Kenneth, yeah. a great, who runs Ubi Web and who we also meet here on the program, a great friend of our center. Oh, yeah. Wow. Yes, that, yeah, that's fascinating, fascinating that idea. So it's what I also talked about earlier that I, that I watch two people in, in the street, uh, how they move and how they talk to each other, but also the kind of text, how we talk to each other in half sentences and then, and then the grammar sometimes is not quite correct. And then we say, ah, uh, and then we laugh and then we start the sentence all over again. This kind of um, way of talking that you don't usually hear in the theater, I, I'm, I, I, try to, um, I try to use. So we um, ask people to come to the studio and read the scenes that I, that I um, wrote, but they don't actually get the whole scene but also only the lines they say but they don't have any context and they don't know what they're reacting to so it's also kind of strange the way when it's put back together again it doesn't fit quite well it's not like they play a scene but we make a new composition out of the sentences they read and then other people read the answers to a question someone else um, did. And you get a very, um, very different kind of vibe through that. And that's, and then sometimes people in the studio ask me questions. They say, how did I do that? Or was that the right way? And we use that as well. So it, it ends up in the performance uh, and the actors uh, playback that. Yeah, I think it sounds very strange if I, if I talk about it like this, but um, mm-hmm. you probably would have to see it and experience it to um, know what I'm talking about. And this has become more and more important. So the kind of in-between talk that people do in the studio um, is a big part of the, of mm-hmm. the performance in the end, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's 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 fascinating that that you do try to capture something real, or the reality in these imaginary symbolic spaces, um, full of you know almost a, a second life of or, or, or virtual um, existence. And there are some connections to the quiet theater movement, you know, from that comes from uh, Japan, uh, where you know this uh, uh, you look at the moment, you know, you take a knife, you cut a zucchini, and say which way do I cut it? And that's what life is about in a way. This is you have to focus on it and know about it. And um, and Kenneth says, yeah, uncreative uh, writing ideas, which are so significant. Um, what I find most uh, fascinating about your work, and I think you touched on it about the reaction of the audience member and, um, and Thomas Oberander, who also connected. And I want to thank Thomas, and he talked also about you. Um, and spoke about it and sent me a, a, um, a podcast from Thomas Metzinger, a German philosopher, um, who talks about virtual realities and that what we see, our mind processes reality. We think it's real, but it's a dream. We just constructed our nerves, our brain, our cells create something, and we don't know it, and we have no chance um, of escaping. And um, so, the idea of that kind of a virtual reality which you touch on and, and so are you are you interested in that and the ideas of Metzinger what what do they mean to you yes i'm uh, so it's it's this idea of the reality i'm being told that is this reality i i sometimes doubt it let's Let's say it like this. And I'm trying to find means to, um, to, to take a different observation point and look at it in a different way. So that what you say, it's a construct, 
a construct we 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 make ourselves and the society we are in it's very much a construct we, we we're being born and we get handed a script immediately that we have to learn by heart and then we we do it and we but we think it's our own words so we think but i'm an inv individual what i'm saying is very uh, unique but uh, and we 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 don't realize that often we're talking in scripts that were being, you know, that were being written for us by by whom? I mean, it's that's a whole different question. So I'm trying to find out how can I. So I have I have the, this feeling in a sense, but how do I find out about it? And the, there are of course ancient sacred practices that. Um, deal with it. It's in, 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 in every um, sacred tra tradition is the, the idea of awakening. So you wake up and you realize that it was a dream and you wake up in a different, um, yeah, in a different state of being where you suddenly see that it was all an illusion, but an important illusion. It doesn't mean that this doesn't matter or it's not important. Um, so I'm always trying to find um, people who can talk about it in a way that I can access it. Because it seems when you first hear about that or think about it, it seems very far away or something you think, how can I possibly, you know, it's, a, it's, it's the idea of enlightenment, I guess. But awakening, I, I find that word very, very interesting. So what... Does it mean what I dreamt last night? Is it less real than what I experienced during the day? Um, because that's what we think. Dreams do not, you know, they're not important. It's just something. I had this strange dream and you forget about it as, as soon as you wake up. What if life itself is a very strange dream? So I'm very fascinated about this. And, and I mean, when you saw Ultra World, I mean, you also probably saw that it, the idea of like this film matrix it's very much this idea you know that we're <laughs> in this matrix and how can we um surpass it how can we um find our way out of it and then the matrix is in your own head it's i'm not so much interested in this idea that you know we're kept in a system that controls us uh, this is, I think, in the matrix, it doesn't go far enough. So it's the idea is you are your own controller. Um, of course, it's part of a system. Mm -hmm. But so I'm trying to make theater that that sort of um, deals with that. Yeah, and I, I and I do think this is the great contribution also then of your work um, to um, radically show that uh, the vision of our world is also already a virtual vision that what we have on our head, which I think Richard Foreman once said at the Seagull, we see our entire body, but we don't see our heads, which is odd, but we don't think about it. And, but that what we have over our shoulders is kind of a headset already. It's a VR set that experience a world we kind of combine together and we don't really know it. It's a dreamlike, we accept it as a reality, but it's not. And, um, and that uh, perhaps for that moment to question what's our own reality and a reality on a stage, this little irritation, like your audience member said, now what's real, was that real? And you make you aware of it. And as Metzinger says, uh, we will never be able to escape this. What, as you also say, what we have to perform, the gender roles, you know, let's do this battle that we are told, how we behave as men, women, and all that. But what we can do is to become aware of the process of recognition of the process of working through what we perceive to know we are processing something which he claims also slow drugs, whatever, you know, you see the wall moving and talking says, no, it's not, but you are a bit closer how you perceive the world and it's different than you think and what gets put over. So I think the idea of theater as a, a questioning model, modus, uh, apparatus, robot, that, uh, uh, 
might be able for a moment to, to, to help us to understand these, these world, these immersive world, as Thomas would say, the immersion work he does also in Berlin, that is sensational. So what, what are you, what are your think, thoughts now? Did this time of Corona, did it deepen this? Do we have new projects? Uh, do you say, no, I'm gonna do this not anymore, but I'm gonna focus on something else. Where does it lead you? These really, I think also in Germany was two months at least or two and a half of um, uh, you, would, uh, you would say of, uh, of, of silence or of taking up time out of normal life. What, is there something it's, you focus on in your upcoming work that's different? It's, it's funny how this coincides with my plans because I decided to take time out. So I'm not going to do another production for the next more than one and a half years. Um, um, so it's actually I, 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 I'm prolonging this time of incubation in a sense for myself and to try and go deeper. Because of course, always I'm I'm using the using the work to do that, but you always have to put out a new production, or you you have to. I mean, I'm also lucky in that I can do that, but um, but uh, I have a great longing for um, for thinking, studying, researching, going deeper, experiencing, also yeah, immersing myself in in some kind of practice. So that's what I'm what I'm going to do, and I think um, that I hope that um, I will, you know, I can I can go further and deeper in that path that I'm I'm already uh, walking on. Um, but I have the feeling you always need some time to reflect on what you've done and 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 not um, run into the next. Uh, project again so I'm, I'm I'm going to do that and the next one is I think going to be about female mystics but that's still just a very vague idea but like um, the God von Dingen or, or something uh, yeah, yeah 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 but if you say I want to go deeper what does it how do you actually do that what do you do like you get up in the morning you have your boyfriend you are in in the south of Germany, but um, how do you go deeper for a year and a half? What do you do? How do you go deeper? I asked the oracle that, and I got a really pornographic uh, answer to it. So, what was it? <laughs> yeah, well, go deeper. I mean, yeah. So um, I, what I, what I want to do is go back to the Bible. I decided to go and study the Bible because I think now I have the more the tools to to read the text in a way that I've never been able to read it before. So that's something I want to do. Um, and that, that means getting up, uh, sitting down, uh, reading, um, writing, and then just see what comes out of that. Um, but also, like I said, I have a few, um, like Hildegard von Bingen, Jeanne d'Arc, that, because it's always men I encounter. Also, when I talk about the great masters, it's, it's, it's men. So I'm interested in what is a female voice, what are the female voices in that, um, what mystical experiences, and then talked about it in what kind of language were they talking about it? So it's really reading these texts and then and then um, and then seeing where it takes me. And that's that's the exciting thing that I, now I don't have to produce something. I can see where where it wherever it 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 takes me. And um, yes, it's very much sitting at the table reading, I guess. Mm -hmm like ancient, almost monkish practice, yeah. Um, yes, yes, yes. That's something that I have a great longing for, I have to say, yeah. <laughs> and the idea also then, uh, you know, of question reality and finding that mystical experience or what we say in great theater when we experience it, um, which sometimes happens perhaps in sports, you know, you watch a hundred games, but one game is special. You watch so many plays, but sometimes there's something that touches you so deeply and changes your life and that there were practices as you say ancient practices of mystic is you know 
people who do meditation or yogis to try to capture what's beyond what we normally perceive as reality. And if it is, if there's is there, there, as Gertrude Stein um, um, would say. So you studied art in Amsterdam? You did uh, not study theater performance or was it a hybrid form? How, what, how did you get into theater? No, it was it was theater directing, so it was very right. much, yeah. So it was it it started out quite in a classic way, I guess. Well, in Holland, it's a bit, it's not as uh, you don't work so much on the big stage, but more in the black box theater. It was a very direct kind of um, um, theater style where audience and performers are very close to each other, and and the distance is not so big as in most big German theatres, I would say. I mean, so I, I started out as very much, uh, yeah, like making theatre work like everybody else. I, I, I think it's, uh, and um, so, yes, it took me quite some time to find this form I'm, that I'm using now. It was not something that I had access to right away. What was the moment when you said, this is, do you remember, is that, was that a, a rehearsal a day or a play or? It was a play that I did in Munich. And um, it's when we decided, we were halfway through the rehearsals and we, we decided, okay, we're gonna do it all playback. Uh, so the actors are not gonna talk on stage anymore. And, and it was very difficult decision for me to make because I thought, am I allowed to do that? So, because, so that's something, it's also talking about this idea, construction in your own head that you think this is how theater is supposed to be. Uh, and I cannot, I have to, you know, follow that. So the, making this step and it was kind of sleepless night where I thought, um, okay, if I don't do it now because I'm afraid, then I have to stop. So it was very clear that thought and um, it, then I came back to the rehearsal room and said to everyone, okay, let's do it. And now it doesn't seem, sound like such a big thing, but then it was as if I had um, opened a door within myself where I thought, okay, if I can do this, then I can do anything. And that was very freeing. Um, but I had to, I had to open this door myself, of course. And um, before I hadn't, um, I hadn't be, been able to do that. So that was um, very liberating, I have to say. And now I have the feeling anything is possible. Anything is possible on stage and in life, I think. Mm -hmm. That's, that's quite amazing, especially in Germany. If there's anything we Germans are proud of, the Sprechtheater, the spoken theater, the training that goes into voice and speaking on the stage and to say, now we use recording and we, uh, as a comment, you know, we also listen to the technological voice, which we are used to through the speakers of film. So it's quite, a, quite, a, quite an invention, especially if you say it helps you to find what the essential questions are really about, or that uh, uh, incubation time that perhaps theater could be the oracle that that gives you answers for things you you are looking for. I mean, it's stunning that Berlin produces artists like you or Ida Müller and Wege Wingard, who also are such a fantastic uh, uh, um, artist in an idiosyncratic way um, to, uh, to express uh, the world, who also started out with an Ibsen because uh, also they said, this is what you put on a form in, in Norway and you get money for, uh, for first productions. But still, it goes beyond that in their research into that work. Who did you, who, who are your heroes? Who do you look up to in the, if you look in the contemporary world of theater and performance, who, who's, whose work do you follow in theater and performance? Well, just whom you mentioned just now, Vigat Winger and Ida Müller, I saw a work of theirs, um, uh, also uh, Ibsen, uh, and it was 12 hours long and it was a whole night through and I was, I was, somewhere else, I don't know, it was so incredible, um, this feeling, and I thought, if, oh, if theater can do this, so I was, I was, I was high when I watched that, it was really, 
I've never experienced anything else. So I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful there are artists like this and who go as far as they, uh, they, they do. It's, yes, it's very courageous. And so, yeah, they are, I'm a big fan of their work. I haven't seen anything in a long time now because they have been produced in Germany uh, for quite some time now. So I hope they will come back with something. Very much hope so. Yeah, so they, they, they are very... Who they are else very... is part of your system of thinking? Um, I'm, um, Romeo Castellucci is someone that I greatly admire also. Uh, also that he tries to go to places um, you could call in a sense nearly mystical or he tries to reach do something else uh, in the theater that you don't usually see that's that's so he I saw his work um, at the Ruhr Triennale also a few years ago Sacre du Printemps and it was these machines that were dancing to it and it was one of the most beautiful dances I ever saw, and it was machines. And they were um, spreading white bone powder all over the stage. And um, it's, it's, uh, it was um, from cows, I think, bone powder from cows. And in the end, when the performance was finished, uh, two human beings in white uh, protection suits came in to clean the stage. So I thought that was beautiful. So the machines did the this very, very poetic dance and it was two human beings in the end that cleaned up the stage. That was um, to me, that, that had a great influence on me, that, that performance, I have to say, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's uh, stunning. And who, what else are we coming closer to the end? What do, you, what do you read or listen to in this time of Corona or in general, next to uh, what you already mentioned? What, what is what research do you also do or what secret vices you might have about what do you what what do you um yeah so i i read a lot of what you would call i guess esoteric texts very much that um i'm um there's an author called peter kingsley and he i was it was through him that i discovered the ancient greek uh, practices and um, he um, and also he wrote a book about um, Sigi Jung. So that's something I'm 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 also uh, working on. And I I I bought the red book. Right. I have that too, the big one, the facsimile. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Well, I I gave it to um, my partner for his birthday, but I I, I used it immediately. So. Um, it's, and that's fascinating. So that's work. And of course it takes you, I mean, it takes you years and years and years to even begin to uncover or discover the magnitude of what it is and does. And I, so I'm, I'm turning 43 this summer and I think I need it to, I think you need to be at least 40 before you can start this kind of work. It's 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 the second half of life that you. Um, I couldn't have done this, you know, ten years ago or something like that. So it's just now that I I'm I feel I can get a bit closer to um, to understand or be able to experience it myself. The um, um, the, the to be able to understand these ideas of these people so it's very much and I, I I don't know I read so much I read like I don't know five books uh, at the same time and um, always take notes from this and that what are your five books at the moment oh my god I I'm reading um the soul's code by James Hillman which is yeah this, I know very much you know it yes oh, yeah I, I met him once and had a conversation I have loved many of his books soul's code about the question of the soul and where he got so attacked by the yeah, it's, world it's, of reintroducing it's, that term, and he qu quotes artists as their yes. as heroes, you know, it's a, a stunning book, yeah, on the biographies. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
And it's very interesting to that we, and I also think that help, would help so much that we don't look at our lives as, as something that, you know, a kind of trauma and um, something we were not able to do and it's our parents' fault, but very much this idea of uh, Plato that you yeah. are in heaven and your soul um, chooses its lot so it's um destiny and it chooses it very consciously and all the hard things that you're going to experience and then you pass through um i don't know i i, I what it's called but you you pass through different stages and then you're born and you forget it all but it's this yeah. idea and of the diamond that you have um something in you that wants to be realized but it's also mm -hmm. it can be a very hard yeah. fate that you have to live through so and that of course with all kind of idea of therapy and asking the questions why did this happen to me mm -hmm. and turn it around and say it's uh it's this you kind of or your soul chose and it's your yeah. path i i think it's very i think he says it's a mixture like i think god sits on the throne that souls swirl around and by chance and by choice you come something what you choose and your life's work is to get through that as a mythical uh, or a, a adventure, which you choose to take on. And he says, as a way to at least to look at the world, you know, and to understand and deal with it, like the old Greeks and the Ulysses and, and, and all of it. Great. And what else is on your plate? What else? Because I just brought a few books. What did I bring? What else? I'm reading. Um... I got into, I have something here. Can you read it? It's Russian, Russian yeah. fairy tales. And it's the, have you ever heard of Baba Yaga? No. It's this witch in the, in, the, in the forest. And it's very much also this initiation idea that you have to go to the dark forest and meet the witch uh, in order to grow up and to be, um, full individual and you have to she nearly you know if you don't you have to have uh, solve three um she asks you questions and you have to do the work for her and if you don't do it correctly she will eat you up but if you do it you can come back and she gives you the fire and you can come back and so i'm i'm reading this to my daughter at the moment but i also use it for myself because of course it's very rich and so it's a kind of idea of fairy tales myth and how can you how can you use them um uh, so th that's something i i just discovered um these this these these russian fairy tales so yeah that's also incredible something. quite an eclectic uh, a, a mixture and that's how how it uh, should be like also our talks but this was really a fantastic uh, a moment really really thank you for for sharing what's on your mind and uh, be in the moment also um for for this um, conversation i think it's a great uh, of great interesting to 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 our listeners and me especially and everybody else and to see how does it how is the mechanics how does it work what does one think about what what is the drama geotology of theater but also of life and how do we approach things and i think you really found answers and they are stunning um stunning ones i don't think your work has been to the us uh, no they're trying to get it to new york but um yeah. we'll see okay. will be will be tough in case you want to do your one year and have research and not going out and under confinement yeah. just move here it will be much easier than in Berlin or in Munich, where things have opened. Um, not sure if it's as much fun, but um, but yeah, I think uh, you know really this was a great uh, great privilege to to um, to hear from you and to um, and to uh, know uh, what's um, what's on your on your mind, and uh, it's a fantastic. Uh, 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 way of, of, of sharing and I hope also to our listeners uh, it will give them some um, some peace of mind to see how how, how you are listening to it. Yesterday we had Ping Chong is a great New York artist uh, Asian American who grew up in Chinatown and he talked about his life how he works and he can still go out so he made inspired by Borges a film and looked at all the things in his apartment as an infinite world where you can travel at least with your mind and you're free. And uh, if you're able 
um, to do it, but um, you do this also in your work. Tomorrow at the Siegel Talk, we have the great Mabu Mines, a staple of New York Cedar Lee Brewer and uh, Maud Mitchell. Um, and they will talk about how that, what the time of Corona uh, means for them. And uh, Thursday, we have Tiago Rodriguez. Do you know about him? A great Portuguese director. I heard about him. Yeah, never yeah, yeah. Him. Fantastic work. He did um, the work about the prompter, you know, the souffleuse and uh, theater, that idea of what it, what it means. And Caridad Switch, a uh, um, member of the Latinx, as we would say, uh, uh, community, a playwright, a translator, an essayist, um, I think originally from Cuba, they will, she will um, share um, her work. Soon we also going to have Jacques Rancière, I think, will join us and we will hear from tap dancers. And, um, and many, many others. So really, um, thank you for taking the time. Thanks for HowlRound for hosting us, uh, VJ and uh, Thea and Travis and uh, to the Siegel team, Andy and Samyang. And uh, Susanna, I hope I didn't take you away for too long and from, from, your, from your time uh, with your family. And I'm sure you're gonna have now a nice uh, Baden-Württemberg dinner waiting for you from one of the two families who are competing for sure to, to make you all happy. So it's really fantastic. Congratulations on all your work. And it's so interesting and to, to, to know what you are doing. It's important. We need to listen to artists in these times of uh, Corona and confinement. And it's important what Suzanne has said about the, that part, the incubation time to prepare yourself, what she did symbolically in her oracle piece that you lie down, you listen, you think, and you're ready and you ask the right question, you might get some answers, but you still will have to make yourself the sense out of the answers you get. And this is what differs our time, perhaps from the 20s, 19th, 18th century, where everything was given to you as a meaning, as God given, but it's no longer we have to create our own. It's part of a suffering which we experience, but also a part as Susanna said of a great, great freedom and to be in the moment and to accept where we are as a, a great. Uh, 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 a reminder for also to change uh, authentically and to engage in the in the world. So thank you so much, and I hope for our listeners you uh, will join us back. And uh, it's important that we have great theater and performance, but also a great audience. But also to understand that what we talk about is about you, the listener, the audience member, the spectator, and uh, to be part of, of of that great change. This has already taken change, taken place, it's taking place and we might not see it because we are too close or we are too into in our own virtual headsets. And uh, so thank you so much. And uh, thanks for Thomas Ober and again for connecting us. I hear you also producing a book or he's putting out a book about you and with essays. So I can't, can't wait to, to hear about it. So goodbye. And uh, I hope one day we'll see you and your work in New York. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.